previously spoke about a novel that she'd written. So we all got to know her uh, through that and, and since. Uh, she's a licensed marriage and family therapist, a certified spiritual director, and a certified psychedelic assisted psychotherapist. As part of her training at the California Institute of Integral Studies, Center for Psychedelic Therapy and Research, that's a mouthful, um, she researched the use of plant medicine within Judaism, historically and among modern seekers. She also leads meditation through the Jewish Meditation Center at Congregation Shomri Torah, which is where Rabbi George is the spiritual leader. It's a great pleasure to introduce um, Alyssa, and we look forward to what she has to share with us at tonight's Tikkun. Alyssa. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I want to acknowledge my sisters here from the East Coast and my friend Rabbi Shmuel from Vancouver. So um, really happy to be here with all of you um, and honored to be teaching um, among the various teachers. Um, so I don't think that uh, Maimonides would very much like this coming talk because it's it's uh, <laughs> um, it's uh, not not in his realm of rationality. It's a little bit more on the on the spiritual side. Um, so I want to say a little bit about the background of um, how I came to this topic, and then I'll be um, doing a lot of teaching. There's actually a lot of information that I want to convey. So I'll pause for questions and then hopefully we'll have time at the end for more questions and some discussion. But I want to I want to be able to share what I have here because I think it's I think it's um, probably will be new and exciting for a lot of you to hear. So I want to hopefully get through as much as we have time for. Um, so as, as Barbara said, I, um, I just recently went through a program to become a psychedelic assisted psychotherapist with the California Institute of Integral Studies. And through my studies there, I was introduced to the work of Rabbi Zach Kamenetz, who ran a, um, um, a summit for, um, for psychedelics within Judaism. And Rabbi Zach was among a group of spiritual leaders um, that was part of a re research study at Johns Hopkins um, being conducted by Bill Richards, who's been doing research on psychedelic mushrooms for many decades. And he gave, uh, you know, he, he um, did guided journeys with groups of, spirit, of spiritual leaders. And um, Rabbi Zach was one of those. And from that experience, he recognized the need to, um, uh, to have uh, people working in this realm who are familiar with Judaism. So both the history of plant medicine within Judaism, you know, to sort of contextualize it for modern day seekers who are turning to these means for, for spiritual growth and practices. Um, and so he's starting a series of integration circles for people that might be interested in, in doing this kind of work. Um, and also as part of my, re of my studies, I ended up interviewing a number of contemporary younger Jewish uh, seekers who, you know, you can think about those of us that were drawn to Jewish renewal as I was you know, 30 years ago, it was kind of the new exciting thing. And now there's this whole group of Jewish seekers in their 20s that are drawn to integrating psychedelics into their spiritual practices as a way to, um, to bring more of an experiential um, flavor to, uh, to their spiritual practices. So um, we can can't do the we can't do the experiential part <laughs> tonight. I'm not sure you know that we could anyway, but um, but maybe you know to get in the mindset, you could imagine intense spiritual experiences that you've had 
uh, where you've entered a non-ordinary state of consciousness through whatever means that might be. It might be meditation, it might be chanting, it might be drumming, it might be dancing. It might be with the help of some sort of substance, but we're gonna be talking about those kinds of experiences. And I'm also gonna be talking about, and this is speculative, so I recognize that, but speculations around um, where actually in our, in our religious texts, they might be alluding to the use of various uh, plant medicines, sacred plant medicines to achieve these kinds of heightened states of consciousness. So I want to start with, um, let's see. Is this visible? No. Um. Sorry, somehow it's not working. <laughs> okay, so um, Rowie, can you put in the chat the text that I sent you? So I'll just I'll just or he might he might be able to screen share it if you wanted it screen shared. Could you screen share Exodus um, nineteen, verse sixteen to twenty? Excellent. Okay, great. Uh, so go down a little bit. The next page. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so this is the uh, this is the central portion talking about actually um, when the children of Israel were gathered at the bottom of Mount Sinai and talking about the thunder and light lightning, the heavy cloud on the mountain. The loud, loud blast of the ram's horn, and and I'm sure many of us are. From, I'm sure we're all familiar with this, but basically, it seems to be an experience. It seems to be describing an experience of synesthesia. Um, it talks about the people seeing the sounds and the flames, and the blare of the horn, um, and the people the people see the sounds, and and hear the sights, which, you know, what does that sound like? It sounds like a classic experience of synesthesia. Synesthesia meaning, you know, the crossover of different senses. So Benny Shannon is, is a professor of cognitive psychology at Hebrew University. And in his paper, um, biblical entheogens. Entheogens um, means generating the divine within. A speculative, a speculative hypothesis. He hypothesizes that um, that there may have that um, uh, that the people might have been under the influence of some sort of substance during to have this kind of synesthetic experience. And he brings evidence about um, talking about how prevalent um, acacia is in, in the desert. And from the acacia bush, DMT can be synthesized, um, DMT being a powerful psychedelic. And one of the things he says, because before this, before this verse, it talks about how uh, the children of Israel were prohibited from engaging in sex, which he says is a very common feature, a very common precondition to an ayahuasca ceremony. 
And we'll see, we'll go on to see, uh, we'll see, we'll go on to see other evidences, other mentions of acacia in the in different texts. Um, so if we go, let's see, if you can, can you slide down a little bit, Rui? Okay, great. Thank you. So in Exodus 24, 10, after the laws were given, the people of Israel offered sacrifices and they saw the God of Israel and there was under his feet as it were a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was as it were the body of heaven in his clearness. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. So they, they do the sacrifice and then they see this intense, very powerful, very colorful vision. Um, and what Shannon and other um, historians uh, or uh, they call themselves psychedelic historians suggest is that there was something in the sacrifice that uh, the smoke from the sacrifice created some kind of high. Um, and there's different ideas about that. I mean, one idea is that it was smoke from acacia wood. Uh, one idea that I'll get into in a little bit with a series of texts is um, something called canna bosom, which if you, if you listen to it, it sounds like cannabis. So canna bosom being some sort of mixture of frankincense and cinnamon and other, and maybe cannabis that created some sort of, you know, altered state experience. So that the people who were, you know, the priests and Moses and the children of Israel we're breathing in the smoke and basically we're getting high and we're seeing visions. So that's the, um, that's the speculation. And if we go to the next text, uh, actually, oh, maybe you don't have it. You may not have it in that version, but this is from Exodus 25 which is talking about the commandments of various sacrifices. And um, basically the last, the, the, um, so this would be Exodus 25 verse 14 or so. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold. And they shall put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark that the ark may be born with them. Thou shalt also make a table of shittim wood. Shittim is the Hebrew word for acacia. So going back to acacia wood, um, from which DMT can be derived. Ayahuasca can be derived. Daniel Merker is a psychoanalyst and religious historian, and he wrote a book called The Mystery of the Mana in which he argues that mana contained argo, which is a psychoactive fung fungus that has the same chemicals as LSD. So, you know, again, speculative, but interesting to think about, you know, were the children of Israel eating some sort of psychedelic through the mana that was enabling them to have the kinds of visions that are described at Mount Sinai and in these other places. It's, it's an interesting idea. It's an interesting theory. Rick Strassman um, is a um, scientist, um, psychologist who was the first to start doing experiments with DMT in 1990 when it first became legal again to start to do psychedelic research. And he wrote a book called DMT and the Soul of Prophecy in which he compares, if you look at the book, he'll, he'll have portion by portion where he'll compare what his 
subjects in his experiments described when they were on DMT, the kinds of visions they, they saw. And then he'll bring verses from various books of various prophets from different books of prophets describing very similar kinds of images of clouds, of light bursting through clouds, of creatures, fantastical kinds of creatures. If, if we think about the vision in Ezekiel in the Haftarah, which is actually chanted on Shavuot, where Ezekiel describes this creature with four different heads from four different kinds of animals, it sounds very similar to the kinds of things that Strassman subjects were describing. And what, what Strassman says is he's not, he didn't suggest that the prophets were on psychedelics, but what he does suggest, and this is, you know, an interesting theory that possibly something in the brains of the prophets was producing an endogenous DMT, because we know that the pineal gland produces DMT and that somehow maybe their levels of endogenous DMT were higher than ours were than ours are, and that's what enabled them to have the kinds of visions that they had. So I want to go on to talk about mentions of um, more mentions of um, cannabosum cannabis in the Bible and also some archaeological evidence. So let me just pause for a second to see here any just see, check in, see if there's any questions, any reactions before I go further. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going. So before I talk about um, the evidence of cannabis in the Bible, um, I want to, um, it's, it's just um, Richard Nixon famously said, you know, it's a funny thing. Every one of the bastards that are out for legalizing marijuana are Jewish. What's the matter with the Jews? I suppose it's because most of them are psychiatrists. <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, David Elan is an archaeologist out of Hebrew Union College, and he talks about the evidence of cannabis and frankincense that have been found on an altar on, in Tel Arad, um, dated from somewhere between 500 and 800 BCE. And I actually wore my Tellerod t-shirt. It says, I dig Tellerod. Uh, when I was 15, I did an archeological dig at Tellerod, Tel coincidentally, but we didn't find any cannabis. Although we were 15, so we would have been excited if we did. In 2020, scientists analyzed this finding and found that there was enough cannabis on the altar of, in Tellerod to induce an altered state. And we know that cannabis was domesticated about 12,000 years ago in Central Asia and came to the Middle East sometime between 2000 and 1400 BCE. So cannabosum, let's go, can you go, uh, Roe, can you go further down in the text? Text referring to cannabosum, it's the next page. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, now you can go up a little bit. Right, great, okay, right there, thank you. So this mixture of cannabosum, frankincense, um, which arguably contained cannabis, was used by worshipers of Asherah, of the goddess Asherah. And this is talked about in the book, The Hebrew Goddess by Raphael Patai. I wanted to bring that in for Shoshana's benefit. Shoshana. Um, 
and also um, by the Israelites. So um, here you have Does somebody want to read this, this next text? I'll read it. Great. Go ahead. You mean the Lord said to, said to Moses, yeah. that one? Yeah. Then the Lord said to Moses, take the following fine spices, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, half as much of fragrant cinnamon, 250 shekels of cannabosum, 500 shekels of cassia, all according to the sanctuary shekel and a hind of olive oil. Make these, make these into a sacred anointing oil, a fragrant blend, the work of a perfumer. It will be the sacred anointing oil. Then use it to anoint the tent of meeting, the ark of testimony, the table and all its articles, the lampstand and its accessories, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offerings and all its utensils and the basin with its stand. You shall consecrate them so they will be most holy and whatever touches them will be holy. Anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them so they may serve me as priests. Say to the Israelites, this is to be my sacred anointing oil for the generations to come. Great. Thank you very much. What's a hind of, uh, is that, I mean, I'm thinking of a cow, but that's obviously not the case. No, it's a deer. A deer, but a deer of olive oil? I mean, what kind of measurement is that? And do you happen to know, Alyssa? You know, I am not sure. I would have to look at the Hebrew, but yeah, I think, I think do you know offhand, Rep. Irwin? I think it might be a typo. Let me, I'll check the Hebrew and I'll pop something in the chat. Oh, maybe a kind of olive oil. No, oh, I well. think it is supposed to be a measurement. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. So then if we... Oh, Diane says uh, H-I-N, a measurement. Thank you, Diane. So there's a couple of other references. Roy, if you go to the next page, thank you. Great. So I just wanted to show you a couple of other references here to Kane in Isaiah, uh, where seemingly Yudhebafe is um, scolding that. The Israelites had not brought any kana. And then in Ezekiel, um, it's talking about how the kana came to Israel from, um, from, from Greece. And in Jeremiah as well, um, kana coming, being exported from a distant land um, to Eretz Israel. And then finally, um, in, in the Song of Songs, if we go one more page down, really. So there's mentions of many different kinds of plants in the Song of Songs. And um, David Elan, in, in a lecture that I heard him give, was talking about how 80% of plants mentioned in the Bible, we don't actually know what they are. Um, but some of them we do know had psychedelic properties. So here's another mention in the Song of Songs in the last paragraph of that section. Your plants are an orchard, orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits with henna and nard, nard and saffron, kane and cinnamon with every kind of incense tree. And then if you scroll up a little bit, really, um, that would be great, right? The mandrake. So I, I also wanted to just bring an example of the mandrake plant, which has psychedelic properties. It's also mentioned in the Song of Songs. And it's mentioned here in this interesting section from Genesis about the story of Rachel and Leah. 
Uh, does somebody want to read this paragraph? Anybody? And Rachel and Reuben, Jacob's first son, whose mother is Leah, went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them unto his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, give me, I pray thee, of thy son's mandrakes. And she said unto her, is it a small matter that thou hast taken my husband? And would thou take away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, therefore he shall lie with thee tonight for thy son's mandrakes. Yeah, so it's this interesting example of how they're um, competing for the mandrakes, which seems to suggest that the mandrake had, you know, that there was something very valuable about the same, about the mandrake. Um, it, it sounds like the mandrake is a, is kind of a sex potion, something like that. Hmm. Hmm. I think I, I learned at one time that it was um, considered um, potent fertility medicine. Oh, interesting. I heard that too, especially like in Italian literature. Oh, very interesting. Uh huh. Great, thank you. Okay, so you can um, you can stop screen sharing now, Rowie. Thank you for that. So I wanted to jump ahead um, to later examples of um, of cannabis and plants being used for inspirational purposes in in Jewish circles. And um, so one of these examples is um, an ode to hashish written by Zev Jabotinsky. Jabotinsky being, a, are you familiar with this or when I see you nodding? So Jabotinsky being a you know, founder of the militant um, uh, group that helped found the state of Israel. And I'll read you this ode. With the tribulations of a forlorn delight, I hover between death to life. Copper bowls resonate, flowing from above the sanctuary. My spirit fades, in the body there is no more strength. My mind sinks, slumbering and not slumbering. And like a verdict with, which thunders in the ear, those ringing bells, and without touch burns a silver fire, and the arms which have no body, and me on a cradle torment, it draws the dream and arouses the fervor, an intoxicating elation. It calls to me, come, and I rush. So that, to me, that was very interesting. I mean, I had no concept, you know, I'd never heard of this ode. And this actually, um, for those who are interested, some of this information comes from an exhibit organized by Edney, um, Eddie Portnoy. Um, at the YIVO Institute in, in New York. Um, YIVO being, you know, um, uh, a collection of hundreds of Jewish manuscripts and documents from Eastern Europe from the past hundred years that was uh, collected originally in Poland. And, and now there's a, um, there's a um, center in New York that houses a lot of these documents and Eddie, um, recently curated, curated an exhibit with examples of cannabis um, mentioned in different manuscripts and documents throughout Jewish history, more recently from the text we just looked at, but starting in the 14th century, there's a, a poem by a entertainer that mentions hashish. Um, there's some references to Jewish mystics using it probably unsurprisingly to us as ways to enter spiritual states. There's a mention, the Chafetz Chaim mentions using hemp to make Shabbat candles. And then and jumping further ahead, um, Professor Raphael Machulin of Hebrew University isolated THC um, which stimulated research worldwide. 
um, working out of Hebrew University University in, in Jerusalem in the early 60s. And then we jump ahead to modern times to um, many Jews being part of the cannabis business to this day. And perhaps it's because Jews are used to being part of outsider, you know, had to be on the fringes of different businesses historically. And maybe that carries on in some way to today, or maybe there's some attraction for spiritual reasons to plants that can induce spiritual states. But there's very, there's many, many businesses, including Mazel Tov Farms in Carmel, um, Token Jew out of Amherst, uh, Tikkun, which is, is an Israeli medical marijuana company. And then there's the use among uh, contemporary Jewish seekers, as I mentioned. So it was interesting to me to interview um, various seekers, including among them rabbis, um, all kinds of psychotherapists, spiritual directors um, who are bringing plant medicine into ritualistic settings as their observance of Shabbat, of various Chagim, um, as a way to, you know, like we might do with chanting or singing or wine, you know, as another way to achieve a kind of elevated state. So one example comes from Greg, uh, who wrote an article in Medium called Shabbat Sharum how I rediscovered the Jewish Sabbath through psychedelics. And he writes, I closed my eyes and saw a vision of the destroyed temple being rebuilt as told in ancient lore. I felt through this collective yearning, we are constructing the long awaited messianic paradise, not as a single world changing moment, but incrementally. I felt an almost overwhelming gratitude for how religion pushed humans to hope for something greater than themselves. That is, each time I journey, the empathic powers of psilocybin reveal a newfound appreciation for humanity and the people in my life. And he actually had a vision at um, the Kotel where he saw the pieces of paper coming out of the cracks in the Kotel and building a rebuilt temple. Another woman, an art therapist that I interviewed, talked about um, being on a plant medicine and, and hearing a voice telling her, um, she was out in the wilderness, she heard a voice telling her, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground, you know, so similar to what Moses, what Moses heard. You know, not, not that she's comparing herself to Moses, but I think the idea being that for those of us who have a strong um, Jewish practice, Jewish back, background, these archetypal themes naturally come to us when we're in altered states of consciousness of one type or another. And there are many, many examples among the people that I interviewed. Um, Another specifically Jewish theme that arose in some of these interviews was that people who are using various substances in therapeutic settings to work through trauma very often have themes emerge around Jewish intergenerational trauma. So some of them see visions of their ancestors um, who went through the Shoah or pogroms somehow having a transfer and transformative experience along with them or or they have the experience of feeling like the work that they are doing themselves in their own psyches is somehow benefit benefiting the spirits of their ancestors and this came up time and time again in the interviews really interesting and i'll um 
we're getting close to the end. I want to show a short clip of a film from Reb Zalman, and then we'll have at least 10 minutes, I think, for, for some questions and discussion. But I want to close by saying that Rick Doblin, who founded the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies in Marin County, um, and this is the center that is currently in phase three clinical trials for MDMA, using MDMA to treat um, people with PTSD, a lot of veterans um, and others with all kinds of, um, any diagnosis of PTSD and trauma from, from various sources. So Rick Doblin, who I heard lecture, um, I've heard him many times, but in one particular lecture, he talked about, he, he himself is descended from Holocaust survivors. And he talked about how he sees um, this emerging field of psychedelic therapy as an antidote to the Holocaust. He actually says it's, you know, these medicines have the power to bring a kind of transformation collectively to us as society and to the world. Um, and that it could be an antidote to some of the tremendous evil that we've experienced. Rick Doblin actually introduced Rabbi Zalman to MDMA, interestingly, um, and, um, and shared an ecstatic Yom Kippur at Reb Zalman's uh, synagogue. So, um, if Roe, now, if you could bring up the Zalman clip which I think you have. And I wanted to show the section from um, five minutes in, starting five minutes in. Thank you. Do we have the volume? This was such an important experience. Did it make you into a saint overnight? I said, no. Uh, but then I asked him, tell me, what would you call the paradigm of the great revelation? He said, Mount Sinai. So I said, that's good. And 40 days afterwards, they worshiped the golden calf. <laughs> so the moral homework that has to be done is not um, the result of the experience. The experience only opens you up to greater vision. When you have the vision, you have a burden that you have to carry that vision out. In other words, it makes demands on you, but you can also ignore the demands. If you ignore the demands, you shut doors again, and the places that have become transparent become opaque. Mm. So the homework, in order to keep the transparency up, the homework is very important. Mm -hmm. And the, I didn't have, this was, this was a, problem and a difficulty, but I would want to say for people who will do this in the future, to have someone who will harvest with you the experience uh, in great detail and so with whom you could view the various things and the hang-ups. You see, you always, uh, it's not that you can steer. The great thing, the difference I want to say between psychedelics and meditation is, in meditation you always can steer. And when you get close to the abyss, you just steer away. You don't tumble through it. And uh, in psychedelics, you have to do that. You, you can't help go down Niagara Falls, yeah. <laughs> right? So uh, when you get to the blind spots in your, in your soul, the things where the neurosis are centered, um, of course you want to avoid them. That's the time when you want to go pee. Uh, in those days I smoked cigarettes still, you know. Uh, you, want to, you want to make love. You want to do anything but uh, stay with uh, the things that, that aren't the pivot of your anxieties. Uh, and, uh, and for a moment the door opens up and you see uh, what Gurdjieff calls the... No, the word doesn't come right now. The, the Enneagram people call it, but the, the fixation, that mm -hmm. thing that is your, your flaw around which everything happens, um, it only takes different 
forms, but it's always the same issue, the same gestalt. And for a moment, the door opens up and you see it. And if you have someone with whom you can um, talk this over and uh, something, it becomes really helpful. I didn't have that, so it was for me taking time out and thinking about it um, and so on. I'm sorry I didn't keep a journal uh, for that. I wasn't into journaling at that time. Okay, I think that's great. Thank you. We can we can stop that. Thank you, Roe. Um, so somebody asked. This is a clip from if you look at if you look on YouTube and you go to Pioneers in Psychedelic Research, Salman Shakhtar Shalomi, you'll find it. So I should have started with the caveat that I'm not encouraging use of any illegal substances. Just want to make that caveat. Um, the research that's being done is, um, again, you know, by MAPS and Johns Hopkins, it's under very uh, contained safe conditions, medical conditions, um, with a guide and with clear intentions uh, for the therapeutic value of the substances. So I just want to make sure I say that. Um, so let's see, I'm going to take a quick look. <laughs> Everybody must get stoned. Reb Bob Dylan, um, Leah said, Leah says, Aldous Huxley, Huxley said that spiritually developed visions were not were not more valid than substance-based visions. So any comments or questions? I'm actually really interested to hear comments, questions, feedback. Dorothy? You need to unmute. I'm doing it, okay. Uh, for those of us who are lead, leading an ordinary, unregulated life, uh, there is, it is well known by the Aztecs, they used chocolate in their uh, religious rites, and uh, it's available in the grocery store. And it does have a psych, psych, psychotropic, let's say, I think it's a little psychedelic effect. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's right there, ready for a research. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really good point. I actually have a friend who leads cacao ceremonies and, you know, there's nothing illegal in cacao. It's basically, you know, very refined kind of chocolate and used in a certain kind of setting. I've experienced it definitely can have mind altering properties. Rabbi George. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, great subject, I want to say, and it touches on this question, how does the finite communicate with the infinite or vice versa, us being finite and um, God or the ground of all being being infinite? And I think um, what plant medicine offers uh, is a way to um, I don't want to say short circuit, but but to answer this question, which can also often be impossible for us to understand or get to. Um, and I would just say my without disclosing too much in my own experience, um, this kind of work can be really spiritually helpful and even healing because it breaks through the barriers of the limits of the mind in its normal state to a place where you can experience um, the infinite in your finiteness. I would also say like you, cautious, not for the faint of heart. Um, and, you know, growing up when I did, you know, especially, you know, in my college days, we, we played with these substances and I feel lucky to so have survived that. Um, and I certainly, uh, I would not judge anyone for what they do, but, uh, like you, I appreciate the caution in saying that while there's 
great potential and potential benefit in this kind of experience. You want to do it in uh, with in the right manner uh, in order to have you know some uh, in order to be a safe, you know somewhat safe. Although I don't know if safe is the word I would use, right? Because you, you have to be willing, like uh, Reb Zalman said, which was spectacular to hear him say, you have to be willing to tumble into the abyss, right? To let go of control. Um, and that's pretty frightening, but um, in my limited experience, uh, really fruitful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Rabbi George. Yeah, I think it does have to be, um, the experience may not always be safe, but you have to feel, you know, there's a lot of talk about set and setting. So being in a setting that feels contained with people or someone you trust and having the set being the mindset, the intention going into it. Tom has a raised hand. Uh, it's actually Sarah Lee. Oh, Sarah Lee, sorry. That's fine, that's okay. Alyssa, I was wondering in what kind of settings do you do your psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and what substances do you use with people? So the only one that's currently legal is ketamine, which is an anesthesia, which at low levels has psychedelic properties. So I've been guiding people and doing integration work with people who are using ketamine. Um, the other substances are only being used legally in clinical trials. So I haven't been able to be part of those yet. But the, the thinking is that sometime in the next two years or so, MDMA, psilocybin mushrooms um, will be available for therapeutic use. And what the clinical trials are finding is that they're very effective for treating treatment resistant depression. So depressions that don't respond to antidepressants or other kinds of psychotherapies um, and also for trauma. Um, again, you know, that doesn't respond to other kinds of less intense kinds of therapies. I, I don't know if you want to, you know, say this or, you know, divulge the information, but I was wondering, do you do this in the context of a private practice or, or a clinic? I do it with a clinic. I do it with a clinic because that, that feels safest to me. I mean, I'm in a clinic where there are anesthesiologists that are monitoring people and also people are screened to make sure that there's no contraindications. So it's a medical setting. Right, exactly. Well, I mean, there's doctors there, but the setting, I think the, the setting where I'm working and I think the, I think settings are most effective when they don't feel institutional, you know, yeah. so if they're, they're comfortable, they're, you know, there's colorful lights, if people want, there's images projected that are evocative, people listen to music. Um, so it's not like mm -hmm. a hospital setting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Sherelle? Did you have your hand up, Sherelle? Sherelle, I think you're muted. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, can you hear? Can you hear me now? Now we can. Yes. Yeah, uh, I have had probably forty years' experience with, you know, marijuana. Basically, you know, I I think I I think I I, I had it before you guys were even born, you know, but. Recently, I have been to a clinic um, to to get my uh, 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 pain med medication, Soulful, which is a very good clinic, and 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 I had my uh, you know I, I I got I bought it, and it was one to one THC and CB, uh, you know, and I, I put it on my back to, to make it better. And I was high as a kite, you know, but, and, and I'm, I guess I'm a little bit, you know, not that well, you know, able well, to tolerate yeah, it, but, I mean, I think but I've, I've I think had 40 years of experience. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, and 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 there was the THC and the CBD mm-hmm. from Soulful, and it's it's a great. I I, I believe in it a hundred percent, but you have to be careful. You do have to be careful. You do have to be careful, and some people are more sensitive than others, and sometimes a little bit goes a long way. So I want to just make sure, I know we're getting short on time and I see Rev Irwin has his hand raised. Yeah, I was just going to share that um, last month I did a ketamine journey um, at Evolve in Sebastopol. And um, and one of the things that I did, you know, like Reb Zellman was saying, you know, in meditation you can steer away and in psychedelics you can't. But I also was... I was very clear about how I wanted to launch and I launched with Jewish imagery and Jewish framework. Um, um, I, I launched, you know, reading a piyut that I love um, from the mystics of Ashkenaz. And, and I framed it in such a way that then what, whatever flowed out of it was still somehow in relationship to that. And so I, I just want to say that it's not like, you know, there's this world of psychedelic, um, um, of, um, you know, transcendent experience. And then there's the Jewish stuff and we're just kind of uncovering what they did. It's like, even in this, even in these non-Jewish chemicals and these non, non-specifically Jewish plant medicines, you can still create a frame of sacredness and uh, that's Jewishly flavored and, and let that be part of your, part of your journey. So that's all I wanted to add in. Mm-hmm. Thank you. What a great way to end our conversation. Alyssa, is there more you wanted to say as we're headed toward the end of the time? I think we pretty much covered it. Um, Except to say that if anybody, you know, has additional questions, they can feel free to reach out. Many, many, many thanks. This is illuminating and um, mind bending. and leaves us lots of room for thought. Um, I wanna make sure we have a little time to stretch before um, Reb Irwin's presentation, which is next. Um, I also, a a, a little pitch, if you are joining us and didn't register, would you so kindly put your email in the chat so that we can include you in follow-up and give you access to the recordings from tonight, um, access to any of the sources that are mentioned, and be able to um, gather your thoughts as we look to how we pull this together for next year. So um, I'm going to take a a five, six, seven minute break. um, And Reb Irwin is just writing that material for the next session. Uh, is in in um, the chat and you can just tap on it and uh, thank you so much for such a fascinating topic and I imagine we'll be delving into other fascinating things in the hour to come I hope you'll stick with us and we'll see you soon Oh, were my comments muted? No, we heard you. Great. Who's Judith? Who was Judith 